Good evening, everybody. Welcome to tonight's webcast featuring the Adductor Canal Catheters for Major Knee Surgery. Uh, I'm Brandon Winchester. I'm the Regional Anesthesia Fellowship Director here at the Andrews Institute. And I'm joined by esteemed faculty from several institutions around the country tonight. And uh, what we're going to do is start with a little introduction, a little presentation about Adductor Canal Catheters themselves. Uh, and then comes the fun part. We'll go ahead and go group by group, starting with anesthesiologist and then finishing with orthopedic surgeon. Uh, as they give you their perspectives for both major inpatient and outpatient uh, reconstructions of the ACL and of total knee replacements, uh, and how we use at our, each of our respective institutions at a canal catheters. So we'll get started with uh, an introduction. Uh, I'd like to introduce to my right uh, several of my colleagues here at the Andrews Institute, uh, Dr. Greg Hickman and Dr. James Andrews. Uh, Dr. Hickman's my partner in the anesthesiology department, and Dr. Andrews uh, is our Head honcho, orthopedic surgeon here at the Andrews Institute, namesake of the place. I'm and, an anesthesia fellow. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> an anesthesia fellow. And uh, our next group is Dean Giacobbe and David Harwood, uh, anesthesiologist and orthopedic surgeon, respectively, from the University Center for Ambulatory Surgery uh, in Somerset, New Jersey. Uh, and then lastly, joining us are Mark Zimmerman and, uh, and Bindu Bamra, uh, anesthesiologist and orthopedic surgeon, respectively, from the Midwest Orthopedic Surgery Hospital uh, in Franklin, Wisconsin, otherwise known as MOSH. So welcome, everybody. We're glad to have you. Just a little disclosure for everybody watching at home. This is a jointly presented webcast. You're watching it on blockjocks.com. Uh, we're jointly presenting it with the Andrews Research and Education Institute, uh, as well as with support from iFlow Corporation. Uh, I'd also like to provide a little special thank you to my wife, Emily, uh, who's also helping with the webcast, is in charge of our education and research uh, in the Block Jocks Research and Education Foundation. So thanks to Emily in the back for your help tonight. A little slide that I just created a few minutes ago, actually. We've had a lot of signups for this webcast. We thought, yeah, we'll do our usual kind of 30 or 40 patient, uh, people watching from home. Uh, it turns out it's blossomed into about three or 400 people watching tonight. Uh, as well as about 40 or so countries represented. I think just about every state in the United States is represented. And I think last I counted before we went live, uh, about 40 countries represented. I apologize if I don't represent your country's flag there. We only had so much room on the slide for this one. Uh, but welcome, everybody. Uh, probably as equally impressive as the number of countries represented uh, are the number of countries that are after midnight right now watching. So <laughs> I'm sure that. Uh, I'm sure that people are, uh, are, are perhaps uh, in need of staying awake, so hopefully we'll provide some, uh, some entertain entertainment for you tonight. So a little bit about where we're at right now. Uh, for those of you who haven't come down and done our preceptorship or visited Dr. Andrews uh, in the operating room here, uh, this picture on the left is Pensacola Beach. Uh, all of our faculty right now are staying at the Hilton here on Pensacola Beach. And if you cross this little bridge to Gulf Breeze, we're on the little peninsula here, and the Andrews Institute, pictured on the right, uh, is right in the upper left corner of that picture there. So for those of you who ever come and do any of our educational activities here, uh, I'd recommend you stay here on the beach and uh, have about a five minute drive uh, to our institution. So here's an outline of what we're going to be talking about in the introductory talk. Uh, I'll talk to you about adductor canal catheters. We'll talk about the block and the anatomy of the block itself. Uh, we'll talk about the indications, why we do this block, uh, tell you a little bit about the evidence, uh, and then feature a few video clips of our technique uh, as before we move on to, uh, to Dr. Hickman and Dr. Andrews giving their more specific perspective about our experience with ACL reconstruction here at Andrews. So the anatomy of the adductor canal is pictured uh, here. And on the left, you can see um, the sartorius muscles sort of spinning there. And that's probably the most key muscular landmark when we're doing this block. Uh, we're going to go about the mid-thigh mid, mid, uh, mid -thigh location and the adductor canal that we're looking for uh, is usually first identified by finding the femoral artery uh, and possibly the femoral vein. Uh, and in that canal lies the saphenous nerve, uh, lies the posterior branch to the obturator nerve, several articulating branches to the knee. Uh, we used to often call this a saphenous nerve block, but in fact, there are several additional nerves of importance in that canal. Uh, and that whole canal, in addition to the sartorius muscle, uh, is made up uh, of by the uh, adductor longus, uh, as well as um, the vastus medialis muscle. So when you get your needle within that canal, as we'll show you in a few minutes, uh, you can get excellent analgesia to the knee. Now traditionally when we've taught this block, uh, it's been taught as essentially a saphenous nerve block. Uh, and the saphenous nerve block has traditionally been used as a secondary nerve block in addition to a sciatic to cover the medial ankle. Uh, and what we've discovered over the last several years uh, is not only does this block do what we expected, 
uh, which is that it spares the quadricep muscles and gives you medial ankle numbness. Uh, but it also provides excellent analgesia to the knee, as it turns out. So slowly but surely, several institutions like ours around the country, uh, one by one, have started seeing this benefit and studying this benefit. Uh, and that's essentially what we're here to present to you about today, uh, that there are several additional options that you may not be fully aware of uh, for good analgesia following knee surgery. So as I mentioned, it's usually a secondary nerve block uh, for major ankle surgery. But the preference today, our uh, discussion today, is focused on major knee surgery, where this block is used as the primary nerve block, the money nerve block, otherwise uh, known as. And so in our outpatient setting, as our folks up on the podium will talk about in a little bit, uh, the ACL reconstruction is our bread and butter time that we use these adductor canal catheters. Uh, and our inpatient folks are going to focus on total knee replacements, uh, because that's probably the most common time that you'll see indication to use this block as an inpatient. So how about this, the, the data? Um, there's several papers that have been published in the last several years about this block, uh, and I'll focus on one of these right now. This is a paper that was published in Regional Anesthesia and Pain Medicine. This is uh, a group led by Dr. Yeager, uh, and it was published just last year, and it's titled Adductor Canal Blocks versus Femoral Nerve Blocks for Analgesia After Total Knee Arthroplasty. It was a randomized, double-blinded study, uh, and they looked at several things. They looked at um, whether the patients, they were randomized to receive an adductor canal catheter versus femoral catheter. They all got the same local anesthetic. Uh, they looked at uh, mu muscle strength was the first endpoint that they looked for. Uh, that was sort of what we expected uh, that they would find, that muscle strength wasn't very effective. But the secondary endpoints were what we were really focusing on when they did this, uh, this study. Uh, and that is the number, amount of pain that patients were experiencing, the amount of morphine that patients were consuming, uh, and several other endpoints that you see there mentioned. Now, just a, a quick focus on the quadriceps strength. Uh, one thing that we've all, now that we've do, been doing these blocks for several years now, we've all come to appreciate is mirrored by this study, uh, that when they looked at the quadriceps strength, in particular, the maximum voluntary isometric contraction at 24 hours, the patients in the adductor canal block had a significant improvement in their strength of their quadriceps versus the femoral nerve block catheters. So as you might expect, when you're essentially doing a saphenous nerve block for all intents and purposes, uh, we did not anticipate that there would be much motor block. And this study, in fact, uh, demonstrated what we've seen anecdotally over the last several years, that your quads essentially remain intact when you're doing this nerve block. Equally importantly, uh, when it comes to analgesia, it's one thing to have quad sparing, but you also have to make sure the patients stay comfortable. Uh, they found several important endpoints uh, were reached. They showed that the morphine consumption was quite similar in the two groups. Uh, the pain at rest was similar. The pain during flexion was similar. Uh, their adductor muscle strength was similar. They did not have any much, much difference in the way of morphine-related complications. Uh, and overall, uh, the two endpoints that were being targeted were, in fact, reached. They were looking for uh, a demonstration that adductor canal blocks have an advantage of less quadricep block, uh, and, in fact, very little quadricep block, if at all. Uh, and furthermore, that patients were more comfortable and, and um, equally comfortable and used about the same amount of narcotics. So that was probably the most landmark study to date uh, demonstrating adductor canal catheters. So a little bit about our technique itself. As you can see in this picture, uh, we're doing about a mid-thigh technique. We're looking at the adductor canal about halfway between uh, the ileum and the knee. Uh, and we go a little higher if we're doing it preoperatively and a little lower if we're doing it postoperatively, like Dr. Hickman and the remaining members of the panel will talk about in a little bit. This is in a picture uh, of a block after it's been done. The probe is typically placed about mid-thigh. And as you can see on the right side of the screen there, a couple of key landmarks. This sartorius muscle is the superficial most of the muscles demonstrated there. Uh, the superficial femoral artery, deep to which is the superficial femoral vein. Those are typically your vascular landmarks you're looking for. The needle's going to be coming from the right side of the screen, or did come, because this is post-block. Uh, and this is the posterior side, so posterior, needle side is anterior, and you can see the local anesthesia just deep to the sartorius muscle surrounding the saphenous nerve, which is highlighted here. And uh, it's, it's a very analogous to a femoral nerve block where instead of the uh, fascia iliaca, the deep border of the sartorius acts as the roof of that adductor canal, with the medial border being the great vessels here, and the deep border being the vastus medialis muscle, inside which, in addition to those other branches I mentioned, uh, the key branch seems to be the saphenous nerve. So I'll show you a couple of quick video clips of our technique, uh, starting with the chlorhexidine prep. Notice that we're doing this patient uh, preoperatively, and we're going to go about mid-thigh uh, for this patient. Notice I prepped with chlorhexidine widely. Now, you can do it uh, two, one of two ways in terms of sterility. You can put a sterile condom on, as this video is demonstrating here, 
or you can reach through and hold the probe through the plastic. More commonly now, uh, we're going ahead and holding our ultrasound probe through the sterile plastic. Uh, but if you're going to hold your probe yourself directly, uh, it's important with a catheter that you remain sterile and keep the probe in a sterile condom. So two ways you can do it when it comes to that. So in terms of anatomic landmarks, here's a little uh, clip showing uh, several highlights. We're coming from left to right. This is anterior. This is posterior. This is our sartorius muscle here, the deep border of which is that bright white line going across, and femoral artery here. Vastus medialis is the deeper of the two muscles, and the saphenous nerve is the bright white area just to the left of the artery uh, and just deep to the sartorius muscle. You can see an 18-gauge TUI being inserted. It doesn't have to be a stimulating TUI. It can be a plain epidural TUI because uh, you don't need to stimulate for this block. Remember, this is a sensory nerve that we're targeting, the saphenous nerve in that adductor canal. So you'll feel a, a distinct pop as your TUI needle gets through the sartorius muscle. If you were to turn a stimulating needle on, you'd see a sensory twitch. Your patient would feel a tapping sensory twitch in their medial calf, but that's not a necessary part of this procedure. Typically, once you get into that compartment, You'll go ahead and stabilize your needle, and you'll look for the endpoint. The main endpoint you're looking for is that space opening up, as you'll see here in a moment. So look for that space as the local anesthesia injects. It'll dissect sartorius off of vastus medialis. And in just a moment, you'll see the injection. There you go. You can see the space opening up really nicely. You can see the saphenous nerve pushing up. Vastus medialis muscle pushing down, sartorius muscle pushing down, and the vessels pushing to the right. Now at that point, we'll just go ahead and thread a catheter several centimeters in. Uh, lately, as we'll, as we'll talk about in a little bit, we've been threading the catheter up uh, or down the canal, depending on whether we're distal in the thigh versus proximal in the thigh. Uh, but the, the take home message is that once you get that injection spread that I just demonstrated, uh, you'll go ahead and thread your catheter several centimeters in and you're done. Uh, it's really not much harder to place a catheter versus a single injection nerve block with this approach. So after going ahead and threading your catheter, putting some skin uh, adhesive on, you can see we're putting a tagaderm on about mid-thigh there. Okay, I just want to point out one thing here that the dressing's about mid-thigh there. So as Dr. Higman will talk about in a little bit, if you're doing this post-operatively, you're okay to air a little bit on the side of distal down here a little bit closer to the, to the, um, to the surgeon's field. Of course, if you're doing this preoperatively, my recommendation is to go about three hands breadth above the kneecap. One, two, three. This, this actual video clip is a little lower than we've been going lately. We've been going a full three hand breadths above the kneecap and then inserting with the probe rotated obliquely a little bit more proximally so that your, incision, your insertion uh, as well as your dressing remain above the lower margin of the tourniquet. So that's just a little tip and trick there for you. And that summarizes the, uh, the presentation to start with. We went over the basic anatomy of the adductor canal uh, in addition to the saphenous nerve, uh, the other nerve branches that lie in the adductor canal. Uh, we talked about the indications, the traditional indications being a saphenous nerve block for medial ankle pain, uh, but the focus of tonight's webcast being major knee surgery, uh, ACL reconstructions on the outpatient basis, total knee replacements on the inpatient basis. Uh, we talked about some evidence that's been presented as of late, uh, demonstrating what seems to be a pretty similar analgesic effect for adductor canal catheters versus femoral catheters, uh, and then lastly showed you a couple of tips and tricks about the technique itself of placing the adductor canal catheter. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce again uh, my colleagues from the Andrews Institute, Dr. Greg Hickman and Dr. James Andrews, uh, who are going to be taking over the mic. Thanks, Brandon. And we'll talk a little bit about um, our approach to the... Um, that's going the wrong way. Thanks. Okay, Brandon, we're, we're going to talk a little about uh, how we do ACL reconstructions and post-op analgesia here at the, uh, at the Andrews Institute. Since uh, I get to work with probably the world's most renowned ACL reconstructor uh, in, the, in the orthopedic world, 
and uh, he, we have the advantage of having his beautiful techniques. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the evolution of ACL pain management. I started working with Dr. Andrews back in 1992, and uh, before that it was pretty much IM narcotics or IV PCAs, but uh, we started doing epidurals um, and kept the patient in the hospital for three days so they could do their therapy uh, back in 1992. About 2001, uh, we got forced into getting patients out of the hospital after one day, not allowing us to keep them in for their rehab. And so we started doing single shot femoral nerve blocks. Then in about uh, 2007, when we opened up the Andrews Institute here in Florida, we started putting uh, femoral nerve catheters in and sending patients home with femoral nerve catheters. And then in 2012, uh, a couple of years ago, we started doing routinely doing adductor canal catheters for post-op analgesia uh, here at the Andrews Institute. Um, the the ter te surgical technique, Dr. Andrews can talk a little bit more specifically about, but it's an arthroscopic technique. He loves using, he usually uses a patella tendon or bone tendon bone graft and occasionally hamstring, but primarily we're using bone tendon bone grafts here. And, and the adductor canal uh, catheter works really well with, with that post-op analgesia for, that, for those patients. So what we do, we, we're using a multimodal approach, and preoperatively, what I do is a, a single-shot femoral nerve block and a single-shot selective tibial nerve block preoperatively to get them through their first night. Uh, most of our patients, almost all of Dr. Andrews' patients are from out of town. They come in, uh, we do the blocks, and then they go home and spend the night in, in the hotel. And so we want them nice and comfortable with these initial injections. Intraoperatively, we give them a little ketamine, 15 milligrams and 30 milligrams of Ketorolac to help uh, with the multimodal effect. Uh, postoperatively, I go, we go back and put the adductor canal in. I like to put it in postoperatively, put it in the mid-thigh, as Brandon said, and then I thread the, the catheter up uh, from distal to proximal in the canal. And uh, we send them home with that catheter. We send them home with, uh, with uh, the on-Q pump that's set on zero, because we've got their blocks to get them through the first night. We tell our patients, start your pump uh, at four cc's an hour with 0.125% bupivacaine. Uh, we help, tell them to start that at night before they go to bed. And uh, so that as the block wears off, their catheter is taken over. We also send them home with some uh, PRN uh, hydrocodone to take as needed. Uh, and that's basically, uh, that's all we send them home with. Um, the reason we're, we started using this is to try to avoid the motor weakness and improve our uh, patient's rehab. Uh, we were very aggressive with these ACL patients on post-op day one. We want to get their quads back and avoid the quad atrophy that you see so commonly with an ACL reconstruction. So we've, we've had amazing results and our therapists have been extremely happy with how, how fast we're getting their quad going again and, and being able to limit their atrophy. They, they tell us that uh, we're like a couple months ahead of, uh, in quad rehab within just a few weeks. And uh, I think we're seeing less fiber adhesions uh, with, this, with the better PT. I was talking to Dr. Andrews just a few weeks ago. We just, back when we were doing epidurals, we used to see a fair amount of patients would, would have difficulty therapy and not do well, and, and we'd have to bring them back in and, and uh, break up those adhesions and get their movement going. And we just don't see that much, much anymore, uh, very rarely, uh, with, with better rehab. Now, occasionally on, on, on post-op day one when that initial femoral block is, is wearing off and they're transitioning to the catheter, uh, probably about 10 to 20% of the patients need a bolus on post-op day one. And I can eat, we'll either give them a 10 cc bolus of some bupivacaine or just tell them to turn their pump up to 14 cc's an hour for an hour or two. And that usually gets them caught up and then they do fine after that. The only other issue we've seen is um, posterior pain in patients that have had uh, significant meniscus repairs uh, along with their ACL reconstruction. And a couple of times, on a couple of instances, we've had to go and repeat the uh, sciatic, the, the popliteal block for that posterior pain on a couple of patients on post-op day one. I want to show you a couple of videos of a couple of patients we've done. Uh, the first one's a 15-year-old female hockey player from Minnesota. She was having a revision ACL, and so we had to use a contra, contralateral patella tendon graft. Uh, so in this girl, we put bilateral ductor canal catheters. And uh, the, the ACL leg, we did the femoral and, and, and tibial nerve blocks, but on the graft side, all we did was the adductor canal catheter. 
when Dr. Andrews started doing these, I was like, holy cow, how am I going to be able to manage these people's pain and be able to do them as an outpatient and go home and ambulate? Well, the adductor canal catheter has been a, a savior for us in, in this patient. So we're going to look at her on post-op day one, about 20 hours after surgery. Here she is in therapy. Um, this is her uh, graft side leg, and this is her ACL reconstruction. And unfortunately, we don't have any video with her, but she's doing this with ease. And I asked her, I said, are you having any pain? And she just laughed and said no. So we've been extremely happy with this, with this rehab in our physical therapy department. Okay, our second patient I want to take a look at is a 15-year-old male from Texas having a revision ACL. Now, luckily, we were able to do an ipsilateral graft, a teletinian graft on him, and so uh, we just had the one leg to work with. But we're going to take a look at him on post-op day three after his adductor canal catheter, and he's just going to town on the bike here. His mother was, was so impressed. She said it was weeks before he was doing anything like this uh, with his sur first surgery. Doing extremely well. Come back. Okay, now our patients are all outpatients. We're at an ambulatory center, so we send them home, and then within a couple of days, they can fly home. They take their pain pumps with them, and uh, they can DC their, their catheter at home. And uh, uh, we were uh, fortunate that our, our, our recent patient, Lindsay Vaughn, actually showed how to DC her catheter at home or with our physical therapist, she filmed this, her catheter. And as you can see, the catheter's going in right in the anterior thigh. I come anterior to get into this medial uh, adductor canal over here. But she actually filmed this with her GoPro camera and put it on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> and so I asked her if I could use it, and she, she was kind enough to put it on a flash drive for me. So now I use this to show how easy it is to pull this catheter out. You'll watch your sister get kind of sick here in a second at the foot of the bed. <laughs> just slide the catheter right out and then she's back there holding her mouth <laughs> <laughs> holding her hand over her face her little sister was kind of grossed out by that but if you want to go to Lindsay Vaughn's Facebook page you can see that and so uh, we'd like doc I'd like Dr. Andrews to tell us a little bit about his experiences and how he feels our rehab is going and uh, uh, what he's told other physicians first thing uh, Greg I in one of your first slides there, starting back in early, what was it, 1990? Yes, 92. The question is, why did it take you so long? <laughs> <laughs> Look at there. It was an evolution. All those years we took to figure this out. <laughs> uh, you know, initially back in the early 1990s, we weren't pressured to uh, send people home as we are now. And, and we really, uh, I'd say we weren't pressured, but we didn't really have the inclination to send them home early. I remember my daughter Amber was in the hospital and had a uh, ACL from competitive cheerleading in the eighth grade. I did a patella tendon graft on her, and she stayed in the hospital four days. The problem with her was that they were trying to put her in a CPM real early. She had a lot of pain. They kept giving her pain medicine because her mother was sitting there holding her hand, asking for it, and she got sick at her stomach, and she spent the next two weeks about three o'clock in the morning waking up every night sick at her stomach because of all the pain medicine she'd gotten. Uh, then about three or four years later as a senior, she tore the opposite knee, the ACL in the opposite knee, and we were able to do some of this multimodal activity that you were showing there. And of course that was night and day for her. Now in the recent two or three years, uh, we finally figured out that athletes do better going to a hotel and sitting in a private room and perhaps have a, 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 a sitter nurse with them all night long. They would do a lot better than hanging around the hospital. You know, one of the things that you really have to be careful about in the athletic population is uh, narcotics. Mm -hmm. And literally, uh, some of our athletes, a lot of them, as a matter of fact, uh, don't even for fill their, their narcotics prescriptions. And they'll come back the next morning after an ACL reconstruction, and well, I'll ask them, how are you doing? They're smiling, they're talking, they're lifting their leg, and they're already doing their rehab. 
and uh, they will tell you that, well, I didn't, even, I didn't take anything. I didn't even feel mine. I didn't need it. So that's been a, a, a godsend for our patients. The, uh, the other thing is what you showed there that's so important is um, when you have to work on both legs, both knees, for example. You know, there's occasions when we, we're, we're having to do bilateral surgeries, like bilateral quadriceps ruptures or patella tendon ruptures or whatever. And particularly when we have to go to the opposite normal need to take a patella tendon graft for a redo for some reason. And there are some people that uh, are, are going primarily to the opposite knee for a patella tendon graft and not violating the injured knee's patella tendon. But in those cases, you've got to really be careful if, you, if you're giving them a, a real block where their muscles are, are paralyzed. And a paralyzed is a bad word, by the way. <laughs> uh, and, and they try to get up with crutches and they slip and fall and, and break their patella or something. So the adductor uh, block on the, on the so-called normal knee uh, where you take a graft or whatever uh, allows them early uh, ambulation and, and not worrying about them uh, slipping and falling. And of course, as you see there, they don't have a brace on that, on that normal side. But the real deal is, the, is to begin early rapid rehabilitation. And I'm here to tell you that the ability for them to, to redevelop their muscles in their quads uh, with early activity is amazing. I always tell patients that uh, if for every day that they cannot contract their quad or lift their leg, uh, it takes them a week of, of work, a week of work to get back one day of loss. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's a pretty good, pretty good uh, analogy. The, uh, uh, we've had several uh, big time uh, NFL football players in here. Uh, one, for example, that we took a, a patella tendon from the left knee for a revision and put it in the right knee and he had both of his quad girths and power back in seven weeks with the combination of the blocks that uh, Dr. Hickman was talking about. Uh, but you know, the big thing for a surgeon is not having the patient fussing and raising cane at you for creating so much pain. Of course, <laughs> uh, the goal is to, is to is everybody talks about, well, I do painless surgery. Well, you know, that's not always true. But if you can, if you can control their pain pattern uh, the way we've done it here, it sure makes it, your life a lot easier as a surgeon. So hi, I'm Dr. Dean Giacobbe, <clears throat> and I work with Dr. David Harwood. Uh, we're at the uh, University Center for Ambulatory Surgery in Somerset, New Jersey. Um, Dr. Hickman, Dr. Andrews have such uh, wonderful accents. I don't know that it's really fair to make the New Jersey team go second, but we are. <laughs> <laughs> so that's us. Um, I've been a little bit slower as an anesthesiologist at our center to adopt the adductor canal catheter. We certainly do them, um, <laughs> but we're a little bit more restricted in, 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 in our use of them currently, and I want to share our thoughts about that. This is a facility that we work out, and I facetiously here in this lovely setting refer to it as Andrews North. Um, we're primarily doing a fair amount of femoral nerve catheters still at this point. We actually have a fairly busy outpatient total knee replacement program. Um, and because I think that uh, a total knee uh, is obviously significantly more pain in general than an ACL repair, with those patients, because we're a freestanding center like the Andrews Institute, we don't have the luxury of inpatient um, rescue medicines, if you will. And so we've been quite conservative in our approach because the patients go home and we really don't want people to be readmitted to the hospital. So primarily with our outpatient total knee replacements, we've been uh, sticking with femoral nerve catheters. And again, our idea is that it's a little bit more reliable and denser of a block. And while you do have quadricep weakness, these patients aren't having aggressive physical therapy in the first few days. They do get physical therapy at home, but we're not certain, they're certainly not riding bikes or anything like was pictured in the earlier videos. Um, and we also use the femoral nerve catheters in our outpatient unicompartmental knees, although we've talked recently about transitioning that over to a technique more like Dr. Hickman described, where maybe perhaps a single shot femoral and tibial nerve block and then an adductor canal catheter. Um, our ACL repairs, we cover at our surgery center all the major uh, collegiate teams in the state of New Jersey. Um, and we have a several surgeons uh, that do that. 
we're using a wider range of grafts. There's still a, a fair amount of hamstring grafts, um, but in addition to a lot of bone patella bone and the occasional allograft. Um, our physical therapy protocol isn't as aggressive, so the patients don't start uh, physical therapy usually until they're about a week out from surgery. So for that reason, we've been using femoral nerve catheters, sending the patients home in a, uh, a leg brace, and so the quadricep weakness, is particularly in these young, strong athletes, hasn't been as big of an issue. Um, we also use femoral nerve catheters for quadricep tendon repairs, and then we're also using them uh, for a de novo study, which uh, we're conducting at our center. It's a mini arthrotomy where juvenile chondrocytes are placed in large osteochondral defects. Our use of adductor canal catheters, um, actually David and I, interestingly, we work together at the surgery center, but we work at different inpatient hospitals. The hospital where I work, um, we use adductor canal catheters on all of our bilateral total knees, um, and we also are in the midst of transitioning from femoral nerve catheters to adductor canal catheters on our inpatient knee replacements. And I would say my experience today with the adductor canal catheters is I agree uh, with Brandon and Greg, I think it is a wonderful analgesic technique. I don't think it's as dense of a sensory block as a femoral nerve catheter, and I think they do need more multimodal supplementation. And again, that's why I've been a little bit shy about using it in people who are being discharged on average 90 minutes after a total knee replacement in our outpatient cohort. Um, but again, we're in the middle of transitioning that over. We do use a lot of adductor canal catheters in sort of the more classic uh, population that, that Dr. Hickman mentioned earlier, our complex foot and ankle. We have a, a surgeon that does a lot of very complex foot and ankle work. And so in those patients, we're often doing two catheters, an adductor canal catheter and a popliteal catheter. Um, and lastly, we have one sports surgeon who routinely for many years has liked single shot femoral nerve blocks for his knee scopes and meniscal repairs. Um, however, in those patients, he doesn't like to put them in a knee immobilizer, and I was quite concerned about falls. So on those patients, we're all doing single-shot adductor canal blocks, and have really found that to be a wonderful complement. Um, again, certainly not as narcotic sparing as a femoral nerve block, but a wonderful complement, and the patients can ambulate immediately postoperatively and don't have um, any, any, uh, any issues with motor strength. Can you advance me, Brandon? So I think some interesting discussion points I'd love to see kind of fleshed out in the panel here today is, isn't the analgesia from an inductive canal adequate for outpatient knee replacement? Like I said, I've frankly been a little bit shy to kind of go down that path, but I think it's coming. Um, the other question I asked, it's sort of interesting. Dr. Hickman and I talked about this earlier today. I think there are some differences uh, regionally in patients' expectations. We're about an hour outside New York City and there are several major orthopedic programs in and around that area, and so patients have typically done a lot of doctor shopping, and the expectations from both the young athletes and their parents is exceedingly high. Perhaps, I, I can't imagine it's any higher than the NFL pa uh, patients, but it's very, very high, and so it's not uncommon that on our answering service we'll get called in that time period that Greg described when the initial femoral block is wearing off, and they're now on the femoral catheter, and I kind of wonder, will the adductor canal addict canal catheter be you know, adequate to keep them and their parents happy. Um, one of the other things we've shown is a tremendous, we just gathered our data, and in our inpatient program, we've clearly shown that the femoral nerve catheters have made huge difference in decreasing, decreasing length of stay, narcotic use, and some of the physical therapy uh, parameters. Um, and we're now transitioning over to a ductal canal, and it'll be interesting to sort of see in sort of a case cohort analysis, if you will, will we be able to maintain those gains that we've had? Um, and lastly, the one thing I would say in my experience with the bilateral total needs with the ductal canal catheters is that the patients do need, uh, in my opinion, a little bit more supplemental narcotics. And my question is, will that lead, particularly in the elderly patient population on the inpatient side, a little bit more delirium? And then we're sort of fighting the gains that we've made in decreasing narcotic usage. So I'd like to hear you know, the panel's thoughts on those things. Thanks, Dean. Uh, from, a, from a surgeon's perspective, so I, I come from the joint replacement world and uh, have gotten a little bit of pressure over the last few years to move some of my, some of my total knee replacements to an outpatient setting. So I've been working on it for the last seven or eight years, slowly moving towards that goal. And, and what, what we found is similar to what Mark Pagnano, who has reported on this actually at the Mayo Clinic, is that a lot of what you do in the surgery 
isn't all that important, with a few exceptions, and, and we can talk about those later, some blood management uh, issues mostly. But what really has changed everything in the last seven years in my practice is, is what we do around the time of surgery. Preoperative education for the patients, physical therapy ahead of time, expectations of the patients, infrastructure being set up for the patients both in the hospital and at home, and primarily changes in pain management. And uh, I can tell you that when you put all those things together, uh, it's really been uh, a, a, just an, an amazing thing for the patients, as Dr. Andrew said. I, I used to be able to go into my waiting room before I walked into the, um, into the clinic area and, and look at all my patients lined up on the, in, on the chairs. And I could tell the hip replacement patients from the knee replacement patients just by the look on their faces at a month uh, post-op. Now I go in the same waiting room and I can't tell them apart. So it's been a dramatic change whether you take knee replacements and do these as an outpatient or even take these same techniques and use them for your inpatients, it will change your practice and your, and your patient's experience. I'm Mark Zimmerman from Midwest Orthopedic Specialty Hospital. Um, we, our experience uh, with the adductor canal blocks has been, has really changed what we do. Um, we do them slightly different. Um, we do them for all of our um, total knees. We do them for, uh, we do them for the uh, ACL repairs. We send patients home with these. Um, our techniques are a little different. I'd like to tell you why we do it that way and, and what I think we gain. Um, we go higher. We, go, we perform it higher in the upper thigh. Um, the major reason is the anatomy of the saphenous nerve. Um, early in the adductor canal, you know that it's um, lateral to the artery. You really don't see the saphenous nerve most times when you're coming in initially. Um, so your, your landmark is the, is the artery. Um, early in the canal, uh, it's always lateral. Um, as you go down the canal, in almost every patient, uh, it goes to the medial side. And so as you get down the canal, it becomes, uh, it, it worries me whether or not you're actually getting your catheter near, um, near the nerve uh, if it is already transitioned over to the other side. Also, there are some perforating nerves that come off early from, from the saphenous nerve that go to the knee and, are, and do um, account for some of the pain, and I figure if we get it a little higher, we'll account for a little more of that pain. Um, I also don't mind, in, especially in the total knees, uh, if some of, that, some of our drug uh, infiltrates higher into the femoral triangle and acts more like a femoral, uh, femoral block because you'll get a denser block. There's no question that the adductor canal block is not quite as dense as the uh, femoral nerve block, um, but you can get by, and, and up high, I think we have, um, we have much more stable results. I think we, we um, get, get better results up there. So we place it slightly caudal to the femoral triangle. Um, uh, we penetrate the sartorius muscle fascial layers just lateral to the femoral artery. Uh, you know, I use a, a long two-e needle. Uh, I can, we do this preoperatively, so we have to stay out of the way of, of the surgeon's field. So we tilt the probe, um, and going up high in the thigh, you can easily get out of their, their field. In fact, you can almost get out of the way of the, the tourniquet altogether. Um, and with the 11 centimeter needle, you, you, get, you, you don't get any leaking. We don't have to tunnel the catheter. Um, we use a little derma bond. Um, but also, there's a feel to popping through the sartorius fascia. And if you're using an eight centimeter needle, sometimes you're at the hub. And, and you, you may preclude feeling that if you're pushing skin at the same time. So I use an 11 centimeter 2E needle on everyone. I would say if you're doing a single shot, still use a 2E needle if you're going high in the uh, adductor canal because it's very venous up there. And I think the 2E needle, uh, the bluntness of the 2E needle keeps you out of the veins. Um, the dosing hasn't been worked out on the uh, adductor canal block. Um, we started with 30 mils. Um, we're at 20 mils now. Uh, when we do bilateral total knees, we go down to 15. All of them work. Um, we use ropivacaine 0.35%. Um, the reason we like 
a higher volume. I think this nerve is small enough you could pl probably block it with six, seven, eight mil mils of drug. Um, but um, the, the th the, one of the major reasons why I like the 20 mils is that it fills up the adductor canal. You're getting, you're, you're hopefully getting the posterior branch of the obturator and, and hopefully getting a little spillover um, to other nerves that, that leave proximally to where you're going. Um, but also, uh, as a technical issue, um, quite often as you're injecting the drug um, and you've popped through the fascia layer, um, other fascia layers appear. A lot of times when you're injecting drug, um, that's when you can start to see the saphenous nerve. Um, and, and quite often it will be at 10, sometimes even 15 cc's, I'll see another fascial layer. And there will be a fascial layer between uh, my needle and the saphenous nerve, and there will be drug in between. So I'll put, I'll put color Doppler on it, I'll make sure it's not the vein, and I'll pop through. Uh, I think your black will work fine if you don't pop through that because there is drug on the other side of that fascial layer, but you're going to have your catheter on the other side. It, it excretes the drug at a lower pressure, and I don't think the catheter is, works as well unless you, unless you get through that layer. Um, so we advance through that. Um, we run the catheter, we run ropivacaine, 0.2%. Uh, it's usually started at six mils per hour. We start it in the PACU. Um, we also do a posterior uh, block. We had been doing um, uh, sciatic nerve blocks um, with 20 mils of ropivacaine, 0.2%. It works great. Occasionally the next morning there's still some foot drop. Um, Dr. Hickman let, gave me a hint and, and I'm starting to do these tibial nerve blocks and we're seeing a lot less foot, block, uh, foot drop and we're getting just as good pain relief. So we're doing the tibial nerve block now with, with just a little bit of ropivacaine, six mils of half percent uh, ropivacaine. Um, and what we're seeing is that um, the patients have very good pain relief. The first hour or so in the recovery room, um, occasionally they have a little more pain, um, and I'll tell you how we deal with that too. Um, but I've got a, a slide here. Um, basically, this is the sartorius muscle here. Uh, the, this, femoral artery is on the lateral side. This is low in the leg. Now I'm moving up the leg. The femoral artery is coming across the sartorius muscle as I move up the leg. Here, if you were mid-thigh, this is where you would be going. I don't know if the nerve is here or if it's here at this point, but we keep coming up. We go much higher. This is still sartorius muscle here. Um, it's still, uh, the artery is roofed by the, by the femoral, uh, by the sartorius muscle. We are still in the adductor canal. Um, we come in through here and drop our drug right here. Um, there's usually a vein here. It's actually kind of a backstop for us. The 2E needle, if, if your angles are, are um, not too acute, will keep you out of this vein. It's, it, it's a much different feel when you pop through this uh, fascia. And, and this is where we're going. And, and, and as I said, quite often as you're dropping your drug in here, the, the nerve appears, and quite often as you keep going, uh, 10, 15 cc's into it, you'll see another layer that you have to pop through. Um, Do you go through uh, the sartorius or underneath it? We go through. We come through the sartorius. Um, let's see if we can advance. Now, one of the things, you know, that, that the panel has brought up um, and, and is a big interest of mine is, is cutting the narcotics out of this. And the question has been raised, can you cut the narcotics out uh, and still use these adductor canal blocks? And, and my answer is yes. I think we're having a, a, a lot of success with this. Um, basically, uh, the techniques I'm using are just no narcotics uh, at all. And, 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 and I've, I'm going to have to put an addendum to that in a little bit. But when we first started this, it was, it was multimodal. Celebrex uh, works on um, the NMDA. It, 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 decreases hyperalgesia. Gabapentin is very helpful. I'll talk about methadone in a little bit. We weren't using that initially. Um, but the sedation for the block, uh, uh, dexmedetomidine and alpha-2 agonist, uh, it, it works in the medulla, sends down anti-nociceptive signals, uh, and, and it's a great anxiolytic. Um, we titrate a little midazolam, and then ketamine, which is, is very, very good for, for hyperalgesia. Um, what we're trying to do is the, the, the hour or two that we have these patients in the operating room, we're trying to treat um, the problems of hyperalgesia uh, and tolerance 
and, um, and all the other problems that come with narcotics, we're trying to treat them when we've got them because these are the type of drugs you can't use on the floor. Um, when there's a doctor looking at it, you can take care of some of the, the issues that might come up. So, so for the sedation for the block, um, no narcotics and, and, and both dexmetomidine, uh, dexmetomidine and ketamine are, are superb for the, for the pain of that. Now, intraoperatively, um, uh, basically, also, again, no narcotics, uh, uh, propofol bolus. Um, we're using ketamine with, with the induction, uh, 15 to 30 milligrams, depending on the patient. Um, maintenance, um, we're running dexmedetomidine. Usually, um, it, it comes in 200 um, mic containers. We'll, we get four uses, we'll get four patients out of that. And so typically for a total knee, I'll, I'll get 50 mics of dexmedetomidine in. Um, I'm using it as an infusion. Um, uh, so usually start around 40 mics per hour with this. And, and sometimes I'm having to titrate down because of, of uh, if the heart rate slows a little much. Um, uh, ketamine, I want to get another, I, wa I want to get a total of at least 50 milligrams if it's, if it's um, someone old, maybe less. Um, but someone that's already on a lot of narcotics and is big and young, um, you know, I might try to get 100 milligrams in. So I'm adding a little ketamine to this propofol infusion. The propofol is running basically uh, at, at a very low rate, but I think it's helpful with the pain too. And then low dose sevoflurane. So there's so something there that I can turn off that I know is going to be gone at the end of the case and I can wake these people up. Um, also as adjuncts, uh, uh, dexamet dexamethasone at 10 milligrams, it's, it's a, a pain medicine at 10 milligrams also. On Dancitron, um, IV acetaminophen, and then magnesium. Magnesium is an interesting uh, uh, supplement in that um, there's a lot of studies that have said it helps with pain. It sits in the NMDA receptor, it keeps the calcium from getting in, um, and, and there are a lot of studies that say even in uh, orthopedic surgery, that it cuts down the narcotic use 37%. There are some that say it doesn't work, there are some that say it does, but the bottom line is magnesium is, is, a, is a superb uh, thing to give anyway. It's great for the heart, it's great for the lungs, it's great for the brain, um, and, and I think it helps. Um, so all these drugs we give intraoperatively, um, and what we're finding is, what, what we were finding was initially the first hour for a total knee in the recovery room, sometimes they'd say they hurt. With this combination of drugs, they're just a little sleepy. Um, if you wake them up, they may say it hurts a little bit. They don't care. They go back to sleep. If you train your nurses you know, to maybe be a little easy on it, you can get away without much, if any, narcotic at all. We were getting away, I was getting away with no narcotics whatsoever. On, on many, many patients for the first 24 hours. Their first narcotic was when they were gonna get them up to walk the next morning when the, their nurses would give them oxycodone more as a preventative measure. Um, the one caveat to this was that, um, and, and this is what we're using post-operatively, acetaminophen around the clock, um, uh, a COX-2 inhibitor, gabapentin. I give magnesium again the next morning um, and, and here's where the methadone comes in. What we were seeing is it was superb. The first day, patients were just so happy. There was no nausea, vomiting. I was guaranteeing people they weren't, weren't going to have any. Um, and, and their sensorium was clear, um, and, and they were feeling really good. Um, but all about 30 hours to 35 hours into it, they would have a steep step up in pain. Uh, and it would last a couple, three hours. Um, they'd chase it a little bit with IV narcotics, and then it, was go, it would go away, and, and then it was gone, and they were fine again. Uh, the methadone I've added to try to attenuate that, and I think it's working. There are good studies with methadone um, uh, helping with pain 24, 48, 72 hours later, long, long beyond where its half-life it is. It also works at the NMDA receptor. Um, and even there's a couple papers at six months that they're taking a lot less narcotic if they got one dose of methadone right after induction. Now, we didn't have IV methadone at our institution. We're getting it. I'm excited about that when we get back. So I'm going to get, I'll be able to titrate this easier. And I'm going to go to 10 to 20 milligrams of methadone right after induction, and I'm going to leave it alone. Um, and recently, I've even added a little um, very, very low dose IV naloxone infusion 
which also cuts the narcotic use, treats some of the side effects, um, uh, and, and their pain scores are better. Um, and there's, there's good studies about that, and that all has to do with, with um, some of the hyperalgesia and tolerance issues that go along with the narcotics, and at very low doses, it's, it's, it's extremely helpful. And so what we found are these patients, um, you know, in the recovery room, occasionally someone will need a, you know, 0.4 of dilaudid, but normally they get out of there. Um, I don't know why, because an hour later they're not having pain. And I wonder if there may be some toxins built up after the tourniquet that, that maybe, uh, you know, the, uh, the surgical trauma and the toxins together, uh, the toxins need to clear before these things work a little better. But typically, by the time they get to the floor, they're great, all those issues are gone, and the dexmedetomidine has gotten us through that first um, hour or two without having to, to load them up with narcotics. Um, so yes, I think these can be used. We, we use them for bilateral total knees. I'm getting a lot of good reports from surgeons who say that um, the patients, uh, um, you know, I got a call a week ago, guy left the hospital, never took another narcotic, had 117 degrees of flexion at 10 days, walked in without a cane. Um, so I, I think this is working, and I think, I think, you know, narcotics beget narcotics, and I think the adductor canal catheters and blocks, along with some other means of treating um, the nociception, um, uh, really does work, and it can be used for total knees. I would echo a lot of <clears throat> what Dr. Zimmerman is saying, um, you know, being a surgeon, sports medicine trained, but I do a lot of inpatient total knees. Um, we're seeing a significant decrease in the amount of narcotics being used, which really helps the amount of delirium, amount of constipation. Um, it, we've also uh, seen this, uh, doing the adductors, we're, we're not using braces. People are getting up, moving. We started our therapy post-op day zero and we're, our, our average turnover time, we're getting people out is within two days now. We haven't been able to go to the outpatient yet. I think that's probably our next step, and I think we have to, our physical therapists are needed to be trained to be a little more aggressive in getting people moving, but I think that is definitely our next, next step. Um, when we did our femoral uh, blocks at a few institutions, I had a few complications of patients falling and dehissing wounds, so I prefer not to have any femoral nerve uh, blocks done at all on my knees anymore. So the first question I had was uh, directed to Dr. Anders. Uh, it says that you've had some incredible success stories the last few years with ACL repair uh, to add to your impressive career track record. Do you believe that added canal catheters have contributed to these recent successes? I give success to, uh, to, the, to all of the success to the adductor canal. Blocks. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, is there, do you feel like it's played an important role in the rehabilitation I, success? You know, that's absolutely true. You know, show me somebody that'll, uh, that'll uh, give credit to other people, and I'll show you somebody that's successful. So, yes, but credit goes to my gentleman on the left here that, that lets me sleep at night. So, an additional question. Um, uh, why don't I, it's not directed to anybody in particular, but I'll open uh, the field. Uh, do you think that an adductor canal single shot block works as well as a continuous catheter for total knee replacements? No. <laughs> yeah. Well, we, we, we don't use them. I, I don't see a big need for them. Um, uh, you know, if you're going to do a single shot, you might as well get, go to the meat of the matter and go to the femoral uh, nerve. But um, I think the catheters are extremely helpful. You can, you, you, the amount of uh, rehab they can do on these patients, walking around the halls with very little, if any, pain, um, uh, it, it, it's, it's astounding when you see it. And, and I'm not sure a single shot you know, it'll get you through the first first day, but I, I think there's more to it. Yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, just go, going in the day post op day one and rounding on the floor, when before these blocks were in there with the catheter, they'd be writhing around, not moving much the first day. But now I walk in there, everybody's smiling, reading the paper. Already been through their therapy. I'm like, I can't believe they had surgery. It's, it's night and day difference, in my opinion. Yeah, I'd echo, I'd echo that too. I think that's interesting. There's been a lot of talk. I know recently at one of the total joint meetings, I think it was down in Dallas, a lot of the surgeons came back. Very excited with some poster presentations that people made about periarticular infiltration. And again, I think all these things are sort of part of a multimodal approach, but anything, whether it be periarticular infiltration, irrespective of the agent you use, at best you're going to get 24 hours, most likely you're going to get less than 10 hours. 
Uh, and the single shot blocks often fall into the same category. You're going to get maybe 10, 12, 18 hours. Uh, in Greg's wonderful hands, I think it's 20. In my hands, it's more like 10 to 12. <laughs> um, but I think all that stuff pales in comparison to a catheter technique. So I think catheter, the beauty of a catheter technique is you have immediate sensory analgesia from the bolus, and then you have a sustained therapy that's lasting for as long as the pump's got medicine in it, which, you know, in the civilian sector, uh, we're getting 72 hours out of this. I'm also in the Navy Reserves and on the military side. Some of these poor, unfortunate guys, like at Walter Reed, they're running catheters for a month. Um, so I think there's really no comparison in the techniques. I have a question sir, to ask the panelists. Um, the catheters are great. And, you know, I, I tell patients, though, that sooner or later there'll be a little rebound pain when the catheter comes out. They'll hurt for a couple hours. I say, you can't escape pain forever. Uh, and, and it seems to me like they have, they, they'll have rebound pain when their catheter comes out, whether that's three days or whatever, and it'll last an hour or so, and, and, and they need to expect that. But are y'all, uh, is that true with, with what y'all are, are experiencing? Yeah, absolutely. I think particularly in the shoulders. I think it's for whatever reason, I think it's there's something about interscaling catheters and blocks that... Our patients, it's funny, we've had pa enough patients now, we've had people have, not the same setting, but, but both shoulders done, and they kind of tell you, they're like, man, I know when that catheter came out a couple hours later, it was going to be quite an experience for a day or two, and, and I think that's consistent and, with our experience. And, and, certainly. I haven't noticed that with the total knees. Um, the patients, for some reason, if you, if you can knock the narcotics out of the deal, I think narcotics beget narcotics, they, they create hyperalgesia. Um, I have not, I believe that the patients have not been really feeling much uh, rebound pain at the end. The rebound pain was coming uh, at about 30 hours when the thing was still in there, and I think that had something to do with the regimen. Um, but I think that's getting straightened out with the you know with some adjustments. And and uh, I am not you know I'm not hearing that it's hurting after they pull it out. I think the shoulder. I agree. The shoulders definitely you see it. You hear a bit more. But I was trying to help people to take Celebrex or ibuprofen. 12 hours before they pull it out and makes you kind of get out of it that way. I think the other thing that everybody needs to realize is that from the anesthesiology standpoint, uh, your job is not over with when they leave the recovery room because I know when, when we see the patients back at about 8, 8.30 the next morning that are staying in hotels, uh, Greg's over there making rounds on them just like I am so that uh, if he needs to augment them, uh, he's right there. So you've got to work together as a team because it's not just put it in and walk away. Walk away. Uh, uh, so the surgeon's sitting there saying, well, what do you do now? He needs to be augmented. And where's Dr. Hickman? Well, he's right here. He's already done it. So that's how we work, and I think that's very important. I, I think we, we've kind of done this. In fact, at our hospital, we've kind of taken over the pain management in that you know, we, we were able to get a, a pain nurse hired and she clues us in when there's a problem, and you know we watch them very closely. And, and actually, the surgeons are very happy to not be involved with that. Oh yes, uh, definitely. You know, uh, <laughs> the other thing that I think we we should have mentioned here at the Andrews Institute, uh, we have a, a sister uh, a boutique hospital right next door. It's part of our on the same geographic area, and I know in my years here. Uh, I don't think, Greg, maybe you correct me, but I, we, we haven't had to admit a patient to the hospital on, on my service that in the five or six years I've been working here. Yeah, in, in seven years that, that we've been open, we have not admitted a single patient for pain to the hospital. We've had for some other reasons, but not for pain. You know, it's real complicated when you have to admit them to the hospital for pain yeah. management, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's... Mm -hmm. You're talking about paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. You know, the other thing that's interesting, uh, just to echo what Dr. Andrews said, is we have, we use a, a, um, an answering service that's web-based called On Call Central. We've had phenomenal results with them, and actually, as the medical director of our surgery center, I carry that beeper about 90% of the time. And one of the things that we've really found is that continuity of care that you're talking about. So, I get, idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I get all those phone calls. 
but it's actually they're quite easy to handle because that we know the patients. And I think it echoes what Dr. Andrew said is that there's that, that continuity that we're not just checking out at the end of the day, that we're involved in these people and, uh, and it's made a big difference. I, I think if the anesthesiologist takes the pain, the patient's pain personally, it goes a long way. Yeah. Uh, if someone's having pain, they take it personally, they get on it. And we have, you know, if a patient calls the guy on call on the weekend and say there's someone on the catheter, they always have somebody available to answer those calls. Yeah. So the surgeon doesn't have to <clears throat> uh, deal with the catheter issue or if there's a problem going on. So in, in follow-up to Dr. Andrews uh, mentioning the, the rebound pain, I think we'd all, all agree that there is some degree of rebound pain in particular, shoulder surgeries, uh, and that it isn't completely avoidable. Uh, but I do believe that at post-operative day two, there's less rebound pain than on one. On three, there's less rebound pain, four and five. And, you know, you get to a point where risk-benefit favors dis discontinuing the catheter. But uh, in transition to the next question, which is how long do you leave the adductor canal catheter in, uh, in our practice, uh, about the three to four day range is where risk-benefit analysis favors discontinuing the catheter. So we'll usually overfill a 400 cc pump to 550 mLs. Uh, and we'll run it anywhere from four to six, sometimes up to eight or ten, but usually between four and six cc's per hour. Uh, and that'll give them the full, when they start at night of surgery, that'll give them the full four days, and they'll discontinue their catheters and their pumps at home uh, themselves after about four days. Now, that varies from practice to practice, so I open the floor to, uh, to discussion. Um, we're, we're pretty much the same. Uh, three days, I think the FDA says for the catheters we're using that they, they'll, they'll let you use them for 72 hours. Um, there are other catheters you could put in for longer. Um, we haven't gone to those. It really hasn't seemed to be a need for it. I think there are certain patients that would benefit from it, but it's, it's, it's rare. I think usually three, four days, they're over the hump. Yeah, it's, ours is the same. You know, and it's funny, we love the idea of these things lasting forever, but we had one young Division uh, one running back who on post-op post day three pulled his catheter, and then that night called me. He was having fevers. Um, and, you know, you know it's absolutely terrifying. You think maybe, you know, is this catheter site infected? It's probably too early for a surgical wound infection. Um, and I think that experience, like all of our experiences, it really sort of tempered me in the sense that there is a, a cost-benefit ratio here, and I think three days is certainly adequate. And I think the longer it's in, the higher the chance of infection. I think, I think the pumps run out three days probably for a reason. Pull them out and be done with it. Now, there is an exception that I would like to point out. It doesn't apply to adductor canal catheters, but they're going, there's going to be times where you know, perhaps for knee manipulations. Uh, in our experience, it's mostly shoulder manipulations that have frozen shoulders, but we will leave pumps in longer. We'll get the over, oversized pump, the 600 cc pump, and we'll even overfill that to 700. Uh, there's a couple things to be aware of with the risk benefit of infection versus continued analgesia and improved rehab. Uh, and that is that from an infection standpoint, we'll put on a little silver lung dressing, a little dressing that helps uh, treat MRSA and, and extends the antibacterial uh, dressing properties. So that's one thing that we've changed. It's kind of like a bio patch. It's a, little, it's a cheaper form of one. Uh, and then, of course, you need to make sure that you're able to reach these patients each day. Language barrier can be an issue, but if you can reach them each day, you feel like you can communicate with them well, usually patients can do a good job of telling you how their dressing is looking. Uh, but again, like, like Dean mentioned, uh, after about three or four days, risk benefit typically favors discontinuing it, for, except for those rare examples. Uh, well, I'd like to ask a panel because uh, one of the things that surprised me is that the lack of infections from these. Um, yeah. We haven't seen any. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen any. Uh, you know, I don't know if we could push. I know some of the uh, uh, chronic pain guys leave these in a lot longer. Yeah. Um, you know, so I don't. I don't know. I mean, we have not seen anything as far as infection. I hate to say it because now we will, but <laughs> right, exactly. but uh, no, I think it hasn't been an issue. I think the military experience is actually probably the most illuminating on that topic. I mean, if you talk to Trip Buckemeyer and the guys at Walter Reed, they have a large, large case. Uh, series of patients who've had these things in, you know, multiple amputee patients who've had these things in for very, very long periods of time. Um, a couple, you know, like one or two patients who develop, you know, serious infections, but given the number of patients and the duration, um, it, it's really quite astounding. And I think it echoes what you're saying. The, the caveat there is all these guys come over sort of super infected, um, and so they're on multiple antibiotics. So I don't know if it's really comparable to a civilian population. Um, but I cer certainly think that the limits probably could be pushed. Um, unfortunately, in the U.S., with our medical legal environment, I don't know how courageous m most of us are in that, in that setting. In, in our experience of about 7,000 catheters, we've had uh, four infections. Two were those long-term catheters, as Brandon talked about, that were left in 10 days. One was a bad diabetic, 
and uh, and, and funny enough, they've all been interscaling catheters, our infections, mm -hmm. and two were short term that were in three days. One was contaminated, and one was uh, actually a patient had MRSA like four times, and they forgot to mention that to us pre-op. <laughs> so uh, we we didn't get the proper antibiotics on that patient, and uh, so they've all had good explanations for why. And had we known a little more information, we might have been able to prevent those. So we've had several questions that I'll merge into one uh, that are essentially related to the, the tourniquet. Uh, one question uh, was, was asking about double crush to the nerve if you place the block pre-tourniquet. Another question was asking about being above or below the lower margin of the tourniquet or above the tourniquet altogether. Uh, perhaps we can reiterate some of our experiences. I, I can go ahead and start um, by saying that we have two experiences, first of which I'll, I'll start with uh, the preoperative experience, and I'll let Greg talk about the, the postoperative placement experience. Several of our surgeons are okay with us placing adductor canal catheters preoperatively, and as I alluded to in the talk, uh, my first talk uh, usually go about three hand breaths above the cranial margin of the patella, the upper margin of the patella, and then rotate the probe slightly obliquely such that the needle insertion is in plane, inserted even more cranial. Uh, and I think as, as, as some of you guys uh, reiterated, uh, that gives you plenty of room above the lower margin of the tourniquet. So you're certainly above the lower margin of the tourniquet by doing it that way. In addressing the question about risk, um, tourniquet followed by, you know, block followed by tourniquet, um, you know, personally, I, I'm not aware, and correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I'm not aware of any uh, difference in incidence of nerve injuries when blocks are placed before or after tourniquet placement, before or after surgery. Uh, and with it being more of a theoretical concept versus a real concept, and with the practical benefit in certain circumstances of placing a block preoperatively versus post, uh, I feel very comfortable placing it preoperatively with the uh, aforementioned uh, caveats. You want to go ahead and... Uh, Again, it's, it's, it's a risk-benefit thing, and, and, and you know, we, we always place them preoperatively. Um, you know, we go pretty high, so there's not much tourniquet uh, involved, although you know, I'm sure sometimes the insertion site is, is below the tourniquet. And it is risk benefit. When you use this, when you dose it preoperatively, you don't you don't need um, nearly as much in the way of anesthesia. The anesthetic's a lot easier. Um, they don't need as much narcotic. Um, they're not having the big swings in, um, you know, you know their their um, hormone levels. Uh, so I, I think I think it's definitely worth doing. Um, and and I don't think that we've seen any problems from it. Well, there's, there's always different ways to do things, and, and I like, we do the single shot blocks preoperatively to get that preemptive effect on there and decrease the stress uh, uh, hormones. And, uh, and, I, but, and then I just save and put the catheter in postoperatively. I like to do it mid-thigh, and I actually, I thread the catheter up proximally, so I, I probably end up close to where you do by threading it down and where Brandon threads it down. We're probably all putting the tip of the catheter about <laughs> the same place. Uh, but I just, I just, I just want to wait and, and get it postoperatively and, and not be down in the surgical field, do you, obviously. Do you all put your knee immobilizers on in the operating room then, or are you doing it after that in the recovery room? They, they come on. They, they put it on in the operating so room. So you just I work around to, it? Just work around it. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Brandon, with, the, with regard to the question about underneath uh, the tourniquet, you know, there's a, for a long time, I think a lot of us have done it, popliteal catheters mm -hmm. uh, for foot and ankle surgery. Those are low enough, they're almost always under a thigh tourniquet, and, and again, there really not, not been any issues. Yeah. And uh, regarding knee immobilizer as a, as a good segue there, there's been several questions uh, about quad strength uh, and several questions about knee immobilizers. Uh, basically, the questions are, have you uh, appreciated any quadricep weakness as a result of this adductor canal catheter as opposed to femoral catheters? Uh, and if not, uh, do you still feel the need for a knee immobilizer when you do these catheters? Um, Start the end there. So yeah, I, when we do the adductor canals, I do not use a brace, and I have not seen significant quad weakness at all. So I've been very happy with that. We go kind of high, um, and and um, sometimes our first the day of surgery, we get the patient to a chair. We're not doing much more than that, and occasionally they'll need a brace, and that's later in the evening. Occasionally, they'll, but by the morning when the actual block is gone and they're running on the catheter, they don't need it anymore. And generally speaking, it's not directly applicable, at least in the initial postoperative phase, because we're typically doing these for ACL reconstructions, which already have a knee immobilizer on. Uh, so it's, a, it's kind of a moot point where uh, the times that it does become an important point 
uh, are situations like uh, rescue blocks. If we're doing like a knee arthroscopy, I think some of you mentioned certain surgeons who prefer femoral blocks traditionally, and I think you've had some good experiences as of late, Dean, I think you mentioned, uh, with adductor canal blocks for knee arthroscopies instead of femorals. Um, and we do quite a bit of those, uh, a number of those as well. We typically don't do adductor canal blocks preoperatively for knee arthroscopies, because of course, as most of your uh, experiences probably echo, they usually don't need it. Uh, but sometimes they do. Sometimes the intraarticular injection, sometimes the multimodal meds, they still hurt a lot. And of course, knee arthroscopies don't typically go home with a knee immobilizer. So the question has been raised on many occasions in our practice and elsewhere, do you need a knee immobilizer when you place these blocks? I think the answer is no. Um, based upon the data that's been presented and based upon our anecdotal experiences, you certainly don't expect to have quadricep weakness when you take relatively close to the mid-thigh approach. And the two things to take uh, into consideration risk-wise um, are, uh, for one, uh, I think as Mark was mentioning, the higher you go, the more potential for quadricep weakness. So that is one consideration to, uh, to keep in mind. Uh, the second thing to consider is volume. The more volume you use, the more potential that volume can spread more proximally, uh, indirectly, uh, and give you motor weakness. So uh, I know um, up at St. Luke's, they've at least published a case report of uh, an incidence of uh, N of 1 of a case report of a quad weakness after an adductor canal block, which I believe was with 20 cc's, if I'm not Thir mistaken, 30, 30 cc's. So it's probably worthwhile, uh, especially if you're using those larger volumes or especially if you're going a little bit higher, worthwhile testing patients' uh, quadricep strength, testing their strength before you try to get them up and ambulate, before you try to send them home uh, without a knee immobilizer on in those uh, cases that otherwise are okay for ambulation, knee arthroscopies being the main example. Any thoughts, guys? Yeah, I agree. Uh, these should be tested. I think you actually, Greg, on block jocks, didn't you have a video where there was a patient where you tested them, but they had a, it was a bilateral procedure, and I remember you testing them prior to going and putting the catheter in to prove that they'd be able to ambulate, I think, if I remember that correctly. I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll do that and just yeah. make sure they're okay. One thing, talking about volume, I find it interesting that, and you read the studies, different people using different volumes, and what I did, when we first started doing this block a couple years ago, I actually took a cadaver and injected 10 cc's of dye into the ductor canal, and then when I dissected it out, the dye all stayed in the canal and it spread 15 centimeters up and down the canal, mm -hmm. just 10 cc's. Wow. So we've, we have basically done all our blocks with 10 cc's because I think if it's spreading 15 centimeters up, up and down that canal, mm -hmm. it's, gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna obviously coat the nerve pretty well with mm -hmm. the initial injection. Mm -hmm. Another couple questions regarding dosing. Some bread and butter questions regarding which local anesthetics are we using for our primary block, which local anesthetics are we using for our continuous infusion, uh, and at what concentration. Um, we can start with Dr. Hickman. We, uh, we do our initial block with a half percent bupivacaine, uh, and then we, in our pump, in our infusion, we use 0.125 percent bupivacaine. As Brandon said, we start at four to six cc's an hour, but we have the adjustable pump and we teach our patients actually how to manipulate it and if they need to increase or decrease the pump. Our nurses do a great job of educating our, our patients so that they know how to go up or down and they can always call us if they have questions too. Yeah, we pretty much shamelessly copy you. So <laughs> we do the exact same thing. <laughs> we use all ropivacaine. We've gone completely away from bupivacaine um, because of some of the toxicity studies just in muscle. Um, uh, and I think ropivacaine is about half as toxic. We had um, uh, one of the surgeons was noticing with his ACLs after the adductor canal a little bit of quad weakness for a few days, and, and we switched from bupivacaine to ropivacaine, and he says it's gone. Um, so I don't know. Uh, we, we use all ropivacaine. I think for us it's an economic decision. Absolutely. It's yeah. a cost issue. Yeah. So there's been several questions uh, regarding the potential for Expirel and how it relates to the discussion tonight. Uh, continuous adductor canal blocks, uh, of course, being the topic of discussion, uh, Expirel being more of a feature concept, of course. Uh, Expirel, uh, to start things off, is not approved for regional anesthesia technique, so uh, it's merely speculative and off-label uh, to discuss, but it is certainly worth um, initiating the discussion. It's probably been one of the most popular topics that we get, uh, Dr. Hickman and myself, uh, at the conferences that we teach uh, every couple of weekends. Um, so, you know, probably, probably worth just, uh, even in hypotheticals, uh, addressing the issue, you know, each of us at a time. 
Uh, it's, a, it's a good question. We really don't know the answer. Uh, there's, we don't have any data on using X-Rail for nerve blocks. Uh, it's only been indicated for infiltration. And uh, we, we just, we've got to wait to see what the data is. I mean, if, if it does, if it will last for 72 hours or so, then, then it has great potential. Uh, we just want to wait and see uh, what, what's going to happen with it first. Uh, there's a lot of conflicting stories, people using it for tap blocks or infiltration, and I hear a lot of different stories about it only lasted, you know, 18 hours or 48 hours, and, and so it's, it's, from what I hear, it's a little inconsistent on the infiltration side, but we really don't know what's going to happen, and, and we just want to make sure it's, it's been properly studied before we start putting it on the nerves. I think, you know, it's interesting. I think Expril, my hat, my hat is off to the company in terms of marketing. They've gotten an enthusiasm among surgeons that's really quite impressive with essentially no data. Um, the, you know, if you look at things like the VA published that monograph where they kind of went through all the literature to date, and it looks like, at least now, uh, at best bet you're going to get about 24 hours of analgesia out of the medication. We like you because there's no indication for peripheral nerve blocks. It haven't, it, we don't want to be at the forefront of that. We want to have people bless it sort of officially before we give it a shot. Um, I know there's been a lot of enthusiasm uh, in the total joint community about this local uh, infiltration um, and moving away from catheters. I frankly think some of that's economic. I think as people are looking at bundled payment, it's a matter of who wants to share money. Um, and I know that's a little pessimistic, but I think it's a reality. Um, and again, our experience has been that I think it, it, it certainly works like a typical infiltrative local anesthetic. And I think at best we're seeing about 24 hours of benefit out of it. And it's a very expensive uh, regimen for 24 hours, vice a catheter technique where you're going to get three days. Yes, yeah, from, from a surgical perspective, well, I do have a lot of experience with the infiltrative aspects of it. And I echo Dean's comments. It's not this great panacea that has been touted you know, from a marketing perspective. Uh, from, a total knee, uh, from the total knee procedure, we do infiltrate all the tissues, but the big benefit that I have seen is from the posterior capsule, and the technique is very important too. You have to actually do all the posterior capsule that's that's been uh, exposed during the total knee replacement, and after doing that, there is, in at least anecdotally our experience, some benefit. It seems to have extended the posterior capsular uh, pain from about 12 hours post-op with the just bupivacaine. Uh, to 24 to 36 hours, but no, no more than that. So it's not this great thing, but it does get you past the first 24 hours, so we still do it. It is expensive, it's over $200. So you have to weigh the risks and the benefits of that. But uh, I, I do use it on a regular basis. Do you put it in before you put your implants in? Uh, yes, and uh, the posterior capsule is much more accessible before you put the implants in and before you lift it. We use a tourniquet, so before you put the tourniquet down as well. Um, and the posterior capsule is the most uh, important part, especially if you have blocks in, you don't really need, it's just belt and suspenders for the rest of the knee. Just you know, it's, uh, it, it's my impression from hearing people talk about that, that they're, that they're really using the, the blocks and the catheters along with this long acting. Is that, is that what y'all are doing? You're not using We are. Are we, are, we are not, I haven't done x -Pro. Maybe more than two or three. In other years. words, it's not going to take the place of, of the use of, of, the, of the catheters, but well, may I, augment it. Or am I, I don't know. I'm just That's asking. our experience, exactly. And it augments it from the, the posterior aspect where you have a sciatic nerve block that's yeah. a single shot that lasts 12 hours. And the occasional patients in certain hospitals I operate, they don't put blocks in because they're not skilled at it. And I have experience with just pure infusion of Expiral and, and Bupivacaine as well. Uh, and it literally lasts about 24 hours. It's not going to replace box if you really want your patients to be pain-free and use little or no narcotics. I don't and think it's going to put you all out of business. That's <laughs> right. what I'm trying to say. Well, and, and the, company, the company is very careful about not, not they won't tell you whether it, you can use a roll pivacaine uh, infusion with it or not. You can ask them and they, they get, they yeah. won't. It hasn't well, been studied. They, they don't know. Yeah, I think the depot foam that holds the bupivacaine they, they really don't want you mixing anything. I know that's a very common practice. Um, they, they sort of say that you can mix plain bupivacaine with it to get a larger volume of infiltrate. Um, but I think Dr. Andrews, to answer his comment, I, I think that we all in this panel obviously are a pretty advanced group of people doing regional anesthesia, and we would think about it as augmenting what we do, but certainly it's out there in the community where guys are talking about replacing regional anesthetic technique with infiltration uh, with Expiril. Um, 
and God bless you if you can get it to last longer that we just haven't seen it. I think it's just a matter of anecdote and marketing uh, versus reality and hard science. I don't and think the company really is pushing that it will replace the use of regional anesthesia. I, I really don't think that. I have a pretty direct line. To you probably way more than I do. <laughs> there was a, My daughter works for him. <laughs> <laughs> there was a poster at the uh, AAOS meeting <laughs> relatively recently that uh, compared uh, a cohort of patients uh, historically that had had femoral nerve catheters uh, and compared them to a more recent cohort of patients that had used local anesthesia infiltration with Expirel uh, and kind of touted it as a head-to-head -head comparison. Uh, and showed, you know, much less narcotic use with the Expirel local anesthesia infiltration uh, and overall, you know, similar uh, pain relief, uh, if not improved pain relief. Uh, there was a couple of problems uh, that I wanted to at least address briefly uh, about a study like that, and, and mainly it was just the science. Uh, there was just no randomization and there was no control uh, of the two groups. Uh, to name a few examples, uh, the Expirel group in that particular poster presentation, which is available on the AAOS website, by the way, uh, had scheduled tramadol, had scheduled acetaminophen, had scheduled non-steroidals, uh, and it was comparing hydrocodone equivalents and pain scores against a group with femoral catheters that essentially had femoral catheters with PRN medications in addition to that. Furthermore, the patients that had femoral catheters were given scheduled OxyContin. And then they were looking and comparing the two groups for the hydrocodone equivalents between the two groups. So when you schedule one group with OxyContin and you don't give it to the other group, naturally you're going to impact the hydrocodone equivalents from group to group. So uh, I think the science was very soft. Uh, I think most of the studies that have been done uh, that have been presented to us at conferences and in uh, promotional emails from Anesthesiology News, et cetera, uh, have been very soft. That said, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It may very well work, but the due diligence has not been done with that particular medication that we in the anesthesia community for 10 to 20 years have done with randomized prospective head-to-head -head trials demonstrating that blocks and more specifically continuous catheters improve patients on a number of endpoints that have been very adequately studied. On the flip side, I think it's just been inadequately studied. So it may work, it may not, but currently with posters like that AAOS poster, uh, I don't anticipate the data is going to be forthcoming anytime soon. Let me ask a question that I'm sure somebody out there is thinking to ask the same question. You're talking about you're using one type of, of what, what are you using? Bupivacaine. Uh, you're Ropivacaine. using Ropivacaine. 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 Can you all tell us, you've talked about cost. Uh, can, you, can you just give the, me, for example, the differences in these two? As far as cost goes? Cost and, and, and the yeah. effectiveness mm -hmm. and what it is. The, well, Bupivacaine is a little, little more... T um, uh, it's, it's stronger, and, and ropivacaine is a little, little less, uh, less strong. It has less toxicity. Uh, the cost is significant. A 30 cc vial of bupivacaine is two dollars. Is that important for articular cartilage then? For articular cartilage, um, well, it's a good question. In the shoulder, we had all those problem issues when we had the catheters intraarticular and all the chondrolysis that was occurring. Yeah, right. is there a difference the, between yeah. those two if you put it in the knee, for I, example? You know, I, I don't, the knee didn't seem to have the same problems. It, I don't it's muscle, not, a, muscle, close, it not a close cavity yeah. like the shoulder. Right. Definitely muscle. And, uh, muscle dies with it. Um, muscle, it's much more toxic to muscle. It's with, much more toxic, yeah. Right, with, heavy, with chronic use. I mean, with a lot. Which one? With the pivot canes. Yeah. A little more toxic What's to muscle. What's the cost you talked about? The cost is, is two dollars and eighty three cents for bupivacaine versus eighteen dollars for ropivacaine. Yeah, and I believe ropivacaine is coming off its uh, patent. Uh, should be soon. Yeah. That would be real great. soon. Real soon. That would be great. Yeah. I don't think, that, uh, Dr. Andrews, I don't think there's any any data looking at chondrolysis versus the two drugs intraarticularly. I don't yeah. think there's not that I'm aware. Of. Not not I could, yeah. Not those and the the problem with the chondrolysis in the shoulders was the continuous infusion yeah. with the catheter. Close, close, close. Yeah, like impressive joint too. Right, right, right. right. Exactly. So one last question that we'll be addressing, uh, as we've talked a lot of science, we've talked a lot of uh, anecdote experiences. Uh, of course, in the end, we have to get paid for what we're doing. So there's been a few questions about billing. Uh, so I wanted to open the floor for uh, one final discussion about how we bill uh, these particular blocks. As you may have noticed, if you've done these adductor canal blocks, uh, there is no official CPT code for adductor canal. It's, oftentimes been considered an other block. And as you may know, with other blocks, putting a catheter versus a single shot uh, does not have a unique CPT code, uh, one versus the other. 
Uh, I, can, I can say what we do uh, in our practice and what a lot of practices uh, do uh, is adductor canal blocks are essentially mid-thigh femoral blocks. Uh, so these are billed with the CPT code of continuous femoral blocks. Uh, it's very analogous to the popliteal sciatic block being the terminal branch of the sciatic nerve and therefore billed as a sciatic CPT code for single shots or a sciatic catheter for sciatic catheter um, injections. Uh, so similarly, the saphenous nerve is the terminal sensory branch of the femoral nerve. So it does stand to, to reason similarly uh, that this would be a reasonable way to do it. Uh, and in the absence of an alternative code, that's what we do. We call it a mid-thigh femoral catheter and we bill it as a, as a continuous femoral block, uh, modified femoral block. So any, any similar experiences yeah, with you guys? Until we did the same thing, we weren't getting paid. They were calling it experimental and we weren't <laughs> getting anything. So we had to basically call it a femoral block. Yeah. We do the same. same we do thing. the same. I mean, it's funny. The one thing that's interesting from an economic perspective is the variance across the country and how much people are getting as a professional fee just to do blocks and catheters, period. It's interesting in the Northeast, it's, it's horrendous, the reimbursement. But we're not a network center, so we're making most of the money is on the facility fees. We're not making it actually on a professional fee. Now, additionally, um, tibial blocks being added. Uh, of course, uh, as you might expect, we, we bill that as a, as a single injection sciatic block when it's an adductor canal block plus a tibial block. Uh, a third interesting question from Dr. Weller uh, was that uh, when we're doing essentially the trifecta, when you're doing an adductor canal catheter uh, in PACU uh, combining with preoperative tibial and femoral blocks uh, with the mentality of dense block up front with single injections uh, and prolonged motor sparing block as a continuous infusion. How do you remedy the billing uh, of a continuous <laughs> adductor canal with a single shot femoral? In other words, is there three billing codes being, being submitted uh, or just two? Well, that's uh, basically what I do is I don't, I don't really bill for the single shot. We just bill for the catheter placement on the femoral. And it's going to be hard to bill for a single shot femoral and a continuous catheter femoral. So we just, we, we just bill for the continuous femoral catheter. That's, that's the way we get, do that one. Similarly, I think we're the only ones that do that. Yeah, we so. don't do that. But I think that's a reasonable, that, that's what I would do if I did. You know, it's amazing to me that you'd have to say that it's experimental and won't pay for it when you're keeping people out of the hospital, you're keeping them away from the narcotics. <laughs> My goodness, you know, it's just, here's medicine. And yeah. Here's a typical example of, of what we're dealing with in medicine. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Well, I wanted to thank everybody for tuning in tonight. Uh, it's an incredible group size from home. <laughs> Some fantastic questions that you guys have asked. Uh, I also want to thank Dr. Giacobi and Dr. Harwood, uh, as well as Dr. Zimmerman and Dr. Bamra, uh, and not to be forgotten, Dr. Andrews and Dr. Hickman, my colleagues at the Andrews Institute, uh, for all getting together for tonight's webcast. Thank you to iFlow, and again, thank you to my wife Emily in the back, monitoring everything and feeding us the questions. Uh, and thank you to our awesome video crew from Barnes West Productions here. Uh, round of applause to all you guys. But uh, in any case, if further questions, thank you guys. Uh, any further questions that we haven't gotten to, like I said at the beginning, we're going to do our best to field those questions. If you scroll below the video player, uh, we'll try to field those questions. Uh, additionally, uh, our LinkedIn page, the Block Jocks uh, Regional Anesthesia LinkedIn page, uh, as well as the Facebook page, uh, facebook.com forward slash Block Jocks. We're always actively engaged in, in discussions on both of those forums. Uh, we encourage you to tune into that. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I appreciate it, and uh, take care, everybody.